Hi everyone. Welcome to this uh, hangout with uh, re representatives from Bosch and uh, Professor Kevin Hartman. So we have Sonay Shah and Reshma here from Bosch and Professor Hartman whom you have seen earlier in uh, uh, the analytics courses. So thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, just a note about uh, how we'll run the session. So I have a few questions uh, that were submitted on the forums uh, on Coursera earlier. I have shared that with the speakers. Um, we will run through some of those questions first. And if those of you who are uh, watching the broadcast live, please use the Q&A uh, button on the Hangout screen. And the questions appear for us uh, in our panel. And I will pick one of those questions. It will show up as the active questions that we are answering uh, during the Hangout. Uh, so with that said, let's get started. Uh, first of all, um, uh, Sonesh and Reshma, I'll move, over to, uh, you know, I'll move to you. We had uh, uh, you know, a few questions come up from the learners about um, not knowing enough or not having enough sources about uh, you know, Bosch tools as a brand. You know, we were able mm -hmm. to give them some content uh, with uh, the folks at Granger. But if you could uh, you know, share your perspectives on first Bosch tools as a brand and then you know, there are some questions that delve deeper uh, into that aspect in the uh, questions I've shared. So uh, could you talk about that first? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you. And uh, you guys are hitting on a problem that uh, we tend to face generally is that awareness of our products um, and our brand uh, in our space um, has, hasn't has been where we wanted it to be in general. But let's talk a little bit about Bosch tools, um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So uh, Bosch, first of all, B-O-S-C-H, Bosch is a very large global organization, um, close to 70 billion euros in sales, um, and has um, businesses in everything from automotive to power tools to uh, home appliances. So specifically speaking about the power tools division, uh, we are also a global uh, division. We are the market leader globally in power tools and accessories. And um, we have a few different brands uh, from a global perspective. We have the Bosch Professional brand, which is in blue, always in a blue color. We have a Bosch DIY brand, which is in the green color, not sold in the United States or Canada. We have the Dremel brand. We have the Skill brand. And those are our four major brands that we sell throughout the world. For this particular exercise, we're focusing on the Bosch professional brand, um, and that's, the again, the blue brand. So anytime you see um, the Bosch logo on a power tool and the color of the tool itself is in a dark blue, that product is meant specifically for a professional power tool user. And so what is a professional power tool user? Um, they're primarily in the construction trades, so they're in building, they're in remodeling, um, there can be electricians, they can be plumbers. Um, but essentially they are building um, and our focus very much heavily so is on the construction industry. So um, you'll see our products uh, at very large scale high rises, you'll see our products um, inside small remodels for example. Um, from a positioning standpoint, um, Bosch has always been very very proud of their heritage in engineering and product development. Um, we pride ourselves on our quality of our products. Our products are, generally speaking, um, at a, a premium level to the market in terms of uh, quality, durability, and reliability. Our warranty and our positioning in that sense is secondary to none, and that's why we really pride ourselves in the ability to be for the professional and used on the job site um, uh, in, a, in a level that our, comp our competition can't match. Our primary product categories, um, um, and going in order of kind of our heritage, actually, and in terms of what we're known for, first and foremost is our products around um, con concrete drilling. They're specifically called hammers. You'll see a lot of, uh, you know, the, they're, they're called uh, demolition hammers, they're called rotary hammers, but essentially these are larger power tools that are meant to drill into concrete. Um, and, and from there, we also have a very strong heritage in woodworking. So kind of on the other side of kind of large-scale construction, you have fine woodworking. Um, fine woodworking is really around uh, the craftsman. Um, having a, um, you know, garage or kind of a workshop where they're building um, 
you know, much more detailed and precision-based um, products out of wood. Uh, at the same time, we have very strong presence in um, in benchtop products. So benchtop products are larger products that have to be on a bench. Um, this would be uh, something like a table saw or a miter saw, and uh, these again are meant for the um, for the workshop type approach, but also for carpentry. So if you're building a house, for example, and you need to put uh, wood studs everywhere, you would use um, one of our table saws potentially or our miter saws. Uh, we also have products in the lines of metalworking, so things like grinders. Um, and, and kind of the biggest category for us that we're putting a lot of our investment dollars into is on cordless. And so what does cordless mean? It's pretty straightforward. It's battery-powered products. Um, so uh, lithium-ion technology has come on to the, to the game about uh, 10 years ago now, and um, it's really changed the ability to have uh, the power you need um, without a cord. So what you see a lot of, and many of you may have these in your homes, cordless drills, um, primarily are the largest category within this area um, and is a big, big opportunity for Bosch. Uh, we believe that uh, we want to push more and more cordless products out there and we also believe that our technology from a battery standpoint and power tool standpoint is second to none. So um, I hope that gives everyone a little bit of insight into the, into the overall uh, Bosch Tools business and the brand, but I'm more than happy to answer any specific questions if they're out there. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Sonish. Um, I know you were also mentioning that you know you also had a look at the kind of uh, questions that uh, people are answering on the forum as well, not specifically related to uh, you know this particular hangout. And you know we thank you for your interest in engaging so deeply with the students. Uh, could you give us an overview of the uh, you know you mentioned you want to share some uh, information with the students? Could you give us a preview of what you will be sending out? Yes, um, I, and the challenge for us a little bit was on two sides. One is, you know, uh, this is a lot more public than we normally share um, some mm -hmm. of our positioning information, et cetera. So um, we just had to kind of take a take some take some internal documents and get them ready for external use. Uh, basically, what we're going to be doing is providing an overall Bosch positioning strategy. Some of the product lines that I just talked about are core users um, that are in our um, realm, and then. A little bit about our distribution strategy, which I think is important for this conversation as well, um, in terms of where and how we go to market. So I'll be uploading a deck. I'm hoping to receive it today. Um, uh, if I don't, it'll come tomorrow. But for the most part, uh, you should see that. And again, I, as soon as I post that, please feel free to ask questions directly on the forum, and I will answer as much as I can. I've just been a little hesitant before we get some clearance on what we can uh, publicly present. Yeah, thank you so much for that. We look forward to that. Uh, uh, so let's start with uh, some of the uh, more specific questions uh, that students have asked. Um, and you know, um, Sonesh and Reshma, you have the um, you know list open with you. There are a few questions from uh, Karen and uh, you know BT and Holger. Uh, if you want to just pick those and you know uh, repeat the question that you're picking out and. Uh, Pick any of those you want to start with. Uh, we can we can go that way. Uh, Sonesh, yeah, uh, you have I'm to gonna um, I'm looking through these right now. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, a question from Karen on competitive intelligence studies conducted by uh, Bosch Power Tools. Uh, if Karen is on the Hangout, could you just give me a little bit of clarity on what exactly you're looking for from a competitive intelligence standpoint? Yeah, I was looking at the list of people and I don't see Karen on there. So perhaps we can okay. move on to the question and answer that uh, yeah. offline on the forum later. Okay, yeah, so let me just talk a little bit about the competitive side. Um, I'll, I'll give you guys some uh, information on um, what the competition for the power tool segment looks like, and I think from a Granger perspective, I can't, I can't speak as uh, holistically on it. But um, from a power tool standpoint, there are, for the professional power tools category, which we talked about, there's about uh, five major players in the market today. Uh, the brands uh, that that exists in the marketplace are DeWalt, Milwaukee, Makita, Bosch, and Hilti. 
Um, and those five probably make up the majority of today's market share. Um, there's, for, for the most part, all five of them sell through the same distribution channels. Um, they are uh, heavily utilized on multiple job sites. What's interesting about kind of the user in terms of market share and, and how they use products is we always uh, say for the most part that uh, power tool users tend to have a rainbow of colors in their toolbox. And there's, so if you walked in any job site today, you'd see some DeWalt, you'd see some Milwaukee, you'd see some Bosch, you'd see some Makita, you'd see some Hilti. And what, what's really happened there is each one of these power tool companies has come from a strong heritage. And they're very well known in the trades for those heritage. All of us are also trying to expand beyond those heritage categories for ourselves um, to build share in, um, in, in different categories. And so the competitive space um, right now is very, very heavy in the cordless segment. Um, and that's kind of one of the focus points that we've hit with Granger is how do we grow our cordless share um, with Granger specifically. So the idea there is to really kind of make sure that there's a large amount of awareness of what Bosch brings to the table from a cordless standpoint, what our technology can do, um, and why it's useful for the Granger consumer. Reshma, you want to tackle another question? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? OK. Um, so just along the lines of what uh, what Sony's been saying, really a focus a category for us is cordless, especially when it comes to Granger, because um, Granger has the platform to really support um, our online our online sales and online marketing. When it all kind of you know it all goes together. Um, so I guess there's another question here from from Karen talking about the voice of the customer and primary research um, again. Based on what I know and what we can and cannot share, um, I can say that we've uh, definitely done a lot of work in the last couple years when it comes to rebranding who we are in our North American uh, market. So for the U.S. and for Canada, when we look at the North American market. And we're really trying to understand and really understand what our users are looking for when it comes to power tools and what's really important to them. And Based on this, like I said, we've sort of rebranded uh, the way that we go to market and, um, as Sony mentioned, our positioning when it comes to our users to make sure that we're able to resonate with them, um, what we're selling, why we're selling it, and the most important aspects of the power tools uh, and accessories when it comes to that. And to be able to not only communicate this in person with our, you know, with our sales force, but also at the distribution level when it comes to Granger and being able to, being able to really sell who we are when it comes to, you know, all the messaging and marketing and the way we look on-site, off-site, and all sorts of uh, different marketing tactics, I would say. Um, thank you, Reshma. Um, uh, let's move on to another question that uh, Bite, uh, and Bite, I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, so her, her question, which is, you know, number five on your list, uh, talks about, <clears throat> Does uh, Bosch Power Tools know which sites clients go to after leaving your site? Uh, I think there's, uh, she's specifically looking for if you if they go to a competitor from your site. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have that information? Um, what we what we know today, the the answer is yes, we have that information. Um, what I can share with you is that the majority of um, of traffic once it leaves Bosch Power Tools today goes to a retailer site. Um, and these retailers can include anything from a Home Depot to a Granger to a Lowe's um, to a uh, Amazon. And most of the use, most of our traffic visits um, that get deep into our site, um, so for example, just don't visit the homepage and leave, um, actually get go out through a buy now. So for example, if any of you visit BoschTools.com and you click on a product, you'll see there's also the ability to purchase, um, not directly from Bosch, but through a retail partner. And we see a significant amount of traffic actually um, feed its way through uh, the buy now currently. So the number one place I would answer is, is to retail, which is good for us because we think that it's a very high intent level that people are coming with. Uh, I think uh, as a follow-up to that, there's a question uh, live by Kevin Park who says, is there any constraint uh, 
to the Bosch Granger partnership to sort of limit the cannibalism. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this also relates to a question, a couple of questions that came up during the forums is that, um, you know, are we really ignoring Bosch's own retail um, efforts? And, you know, I've re restated that, yes, you know, for the context of our project, we are only looking at uh, Granger as the retail uh, or, you know, even if it's a B2B sale, uh, Granger is the outlet and we are sort of ignoring Bosch tools, its uh, own retail strategy. But I guess this question is, is there any constraint on that? So, so we don't have a direct-to-consumer um, arm for the Bosch tools side today. Uh, all of our products are sold uh, through our retail partners. Uh, from a distribution strategy standpoint, Granger plays a very important role because of the user that Granger has access to, right? Uh, mostly in the ma maintenance, repair, and operational standpoint, but um, a tremendous user reach into users that may not, let's say, walk into a big box um, home center, for example, to, to pick up their power tools. So um, it's a very, very important strategy for us to be able to access um, Granger's reach and Granger's service and Granger's um, ability to, um, you know, kind of understand and own their 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 consumers on, at great scale. So their users are are heavy power tool users, um, and uh, therefore from from a for this project, yes, for sure, obviously we're focusing on the Granger user. But overall, this is a strategy that that we we've invested very heavily in, which is how do we access different user groups through our retail partners. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's take another question back from our uh, list by Holger. He's you know one of our very active um, users in the uh, course. Uh, so his question is: What are the key decision criteria for a customer to buy a fire power tool uh, from Bosch? And I think you might have addressed some of this in your initial discussion on uh, Bosch as a brand. So his question is again. You know, is it brand image, quality, service, repair, uh, durability? And uh, a follow-up on, you know, what are the key differentiators between you and uh, uh, other competitors, specifically on Granger? So, you know, as Bosch tools on Granger, uh, what is the differentiator um, between you and the competitors that Granger uh, also sells? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, I'll I'll tackle it from the first side first. An overall standpoint, um, Bosch's uh, value proposition is almost holistically about um, our product quality, um, our commitment to durability, reliability, um, and a really great engineered product. I mean, that's something that has been um, a a heritage element of ours, and something that we've held very very closely. And this is Bosch overall. Um, and I think that resonates, right? When we talk to users about why they choose Bosch or why they don't choose Bosch, um, in almost every single conversation we have, the users will say, um, oh, I'd love to have Bosch tools. They're the best. Or they're the ones that, um, you know, we strive to their, their, uh, um, um, I don't know. I'm missing the right word right now. But let's say they're, they're the ones that people want to own. Um, when it comes to differentiating, however, on a Granger.com, this is exactly one of the one of the challenges that a lot of brand manufacturers face across industries, across um, different channels, right? Because most retail partners want to build a very consistent experience for their users, um, and and what that means is that they'll they'll try to have certain specs or certain images or certain layouts that they want to keep consistent across different brands and products to make their their site very usable and searchable, um, and this kind of hampers our ability to talk to the end user um, specifically about what makes our products better, right? We also um, from a from a competitive standpoint, you won't see a lot of direct competitive um, approach in terms of saying this product is this better than that product. We have a lot of compare functions, but mostly for the standpoint you're comparing things like price, you're comparing things like specs, you're comparing things um, like weight, size, uh, things like that. So we make sure that we publish a tremendous amount of product content out there because the decision makers, um, the users who are buying these products are sometimes interested in very, very different things. Um, 
And, and therefore, we want to make sure that a user can make a very educated decision um, instead of trying to just look at the, the product image, for example, and make a decision, especially the pro, who, who cares a lot more detail about the product they're buying. So um, I would say overall, uh, there's, there's an image around the brand that we want to portray and that we do a very good job of doing um, on site. But at the same time, the differentiators for a product level detail are very, very difficult um, besides just the brand itself. Uh, I think uh, Beate is uh, watching online and she just added a clarification to her question that uh, she was uh, actually requesting comments on competitors on the uh, as referenced on the buy now, buy now web options on the Bosch website and not competitors on Granger. Um, so do you want to touch on that for a minute? Um, yeah, I can't directly answer your question about which one, which is the largest seller of Bosch Professional Tools, but um, I would say that they're the, the biggest competitors for Granger from the Bosch side are, um, you can look at the Home Depot, Amazon, Lowe's as three of the largest um, online competitors, right? I would think that the offline business for Granger um, doesn't have as much of a direct competition at, um, as the online side does. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to change tracks uh, for a bit and move over to uh, you know Professor Kevin Hartman here, uh, who's you know thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, Kevin, um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to, you to uh, you know share some thoughts on some questions that you know came up by students, and I um, you know shared them with you on email specifically about you know, when they are looking at, uh, you know, the consumer decision journey and, you know, using your excellent template of the plan collect uh, and the analyze uh, process and we are making them, you know, think through this in context of the problem that Bosch and Granger have. Uh, some of the comments that came up was, you know, that in some of the cases with their students are not able to find real data. I know Granger, you know, was kind enough to share some last week, so that's given them something to, you know, bite on. Um, but you know, you have emphasized in your videos as well, you know, the the value of using open data. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, that uh, question that's come up a few times? Absolutely, and it, it was it was wonderful to hear those questions because it really meant that everyone was thinking about this the right way. Um, in this course, I think we have tried to teach uh, a couple things. We've, we've certainly taught skills, which are specific tasks, and over time, as students get used to those tasks, they build acumen. It's, it's that sort of, I've done this before, I can do this again. We've also built a lot of theory, which is more just around helping students think through these kinds of problems, and it's uh, we try to provide ways to think, and over time, as you experience that, the, the, you, you'll be building intuition um, in that experience. You know, I, I have seen this before. I know what to do. This kind of question, the kind of the kind of challenge that we put students in front of, really does draw on both of those aspects. It was a very difficult situation we put students into, and we understood that. But to be honest, it is it is pretty close to a real world situation. You will never have all the information you want. Um, um, the information that you request, you'll get parts of it. Um, parts of it will come over time, you know, just kind of clarifying your understanding and building understanding. Um, you know, Sanesh and, and Reshma have shown here, there, there are certain things that as a consultant and particularly as a student in this situation, you will not get access to. You just cannot have even though you would want it. So what we've had what we've created here is a situation where students who are building that intuition and, and, and building those skills, um, we're hoping that um, you can use some of the experiences you've had in the past as well as the things that we have taught in the in the course and just learn along the way. Yeah. So so the challenge specifically is to find sources of information for the things you want. So that's two parts. It's not only knowing what it is you're looking for, but it's also then having some experiences or getting a sense for where those things lie. Now that, we spent a little bit of time in course talking about specific 
uh, opportunities for data, right? We talked about Google Trends, which could be relevant here. We talked about TweetBinder. We talked about Topsy. We talked about a lot of free sources. There are even some that we didn't touch on that I think are relevant places. Um, annual reports for the companies. Compete.com can give some website and traffic overviews. And then opportunities like this as we knew they would come open along the way. So I, I, I guess the, the answer, I understand the ambiguity. And this is exactly as we talked about um, Avinash, uh, a, a reading as part of the course where he talked about poor data quality and what to do with that. Now he's not only talking about data you receive that has errors in the data, but he's also talking about incomplete data. And that is a very real world situation where you're facing a situation where there's more that you would like uh, but you don't have. So there are places for students to look. Some of that they're just going to have to dig and get a sense for what is out there and what is available. Probably even more importantly are some of those theories that we've talked about in the course which can help students determine what questions they should be asking and what sort of things they should be looking for. Um, but all in all, as I said, it, it was it was really it was gratifying. I know how frustrating it can be for students, but it was gratifying hearing those questions because people are then absolutely thinking about this the right way. So uh, th thank you for that um, you know perspective, Kevin. And you know, based on that feedback we got from the learners, we did clarify the instructions a bit that. Uh, you know, you do look for open data sources, but also list the sources that you would sort of your ideal scenario you would hope to get access to and define what kind of analysis you would do on that data even if you don't have, uh, uh, you know, the full data from that uh, source. So, you know, imagine that you would and so do a mix of what you, your ideal scenario and what you have available and mix the two and say this is the kind of analysis I would do with this kind of objective and you know then move on to the uh, you know the next part of the framework that we are having them use. So hopefully that uh, you know that clarification also helps uh, students uh, you know build on this week on week and I think your perspective on learning is very useful and fortunately we have you know we are fortunate to have clients like uh, you know, Bosch and Granger who are willing to, you know, get that feedback and share more information. So we are very thankful for that as well. Um, so let's move back on to a question by uh, Ranjit. Um, uh, and, you know, um, Sonesh, Reshma, you can decide whether you can answer that or not. Uh, he's looking for some more specifics on the nature of data being shared between uh, Granger and uh, Bosch. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, he was looking for, are you able to say very specifically so that visitor X uh, uh, from, you know, some IP is looking for product Y? So um, the answer to the, the second part is yes, you could do that from a technology standpoint, but that's not what we're doing. Um, the, the, data that <clears throat> the data that we're sharing with, with Granger right now is um, holistically on anyone who has visited any section of BoschTools.com. Um, we are essentially allowing uh, Granger to access that audience data. Um, obviously, still they're anonymous, not on a on a PII perspective or personal information perspective, but purely on a cookie basis. Um, so they're able to create an audience in their DMP and market to them. So there's a there's there's no personal data being shared. There's all there is is browser level um, cookie data being shared, um, and it's not on a product level either. It's holistically on a visitor level to BoschTools.com. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Um, um, I think we have um, um, Let's, uh, we have a question for Kevin, so let's move to that. Uh, Marcelo is saying, um, Kevin, can you see that on the screen? I've selected that question. I cannot. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, if you can click on the Q&A button on the Hangout screen, it, the, it might pop up a panel. Great. Yep. Uh, so it's by Marcelo. Uh, should be on the top. So in a real world, to gather data with some wrong bias, uh, 
you might have the market plan going towards a wrong result and spend what device uh, sorry what advice would you give us to avoid this bias mm. you know, it's an interesting question and and a very uh, a re very real challenge and we we did spend some time talking about the different types of bias so there are several ways that you can as a consultant in in the real world work to minimize bias um, the, the primary way is just ensuring that the survey instruments you're using, surveys and other things that you've created to collect data are free of bias. They aren't leading the, the, the answers. Um, you are actually sampling from a representative set, that sort of thing. Um, in the case of publicly available data that you're collecting, um, there's two ways that you can you can seek to minimize bias in that data set. Um, one of them is is frankly just increasing your your sample size. The the more information you collect from the more from from more angles in at the problem, um, the better your perspective is going to be, and the less bias that that perspective will include. So. For an example, for example, then taking taking one data point or one set of information from a single data source, say if you're looking at Twitter, could include bias. As you start to collect other views of Twitter from Topsy and Tweetbinder and Analyze Words and all these other sources that we've talked about, you'll be able to triangulate into a more general understanding which should minimize your bias so so that first way of minimizing bias is is collecting more samples and increasing your sample set the other way is frankly just understanding the source and you know we talked about as I said various types of bias if, if you understand how bias gets into a data set then if you understand how the data was collected at that source then you'll you'll understand if there is bias or not. If, if you can find out where that data set was collected, um, uh, for instance, let's just use Twitter again. If if you're you looking at Twitter data and you know that that these the the uh, tweets are only collected from the most active members of of Twitter or the most highly regarded members of Twitter, that view on the company you're organ you're analyzing will be somewhat skewed. You, you want a more distributed, more representative sample. So, so that second way then is just understanding how the data is collected. Um, any site that offers data, be it Twitter data, be it Facebook analysis, um, the Google site, certainly the Google Trends site and other, others, will reveal how their data is collected. There will be some sort of information on the source. If you can understand how they have collected that data, then you'll be able to see, um, with your understanding of bias, whether that data will be will be tainted or not. So, so the two real ways of of minimizing bias then are just increasing your sample set, getting different views into the the, the data that you're you're collecting, and then also just frankly interrogating, if you will, the data source to to understand if if it is a flawed source or if it is something that has upfront minimized minimized its bias. <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, Kevin. Uh, let's move back to a question for uh, Bosch. Uh, this is by Joshua, and uh, Joshua, I must say, is uh, our, our super user on our, you know, our, our uh, Google community. So he's he's pretty much keeping uh, the Google Plus uh, community for this capstone alive. Thank you for that, Joshua. So his question is, uh, based on the data that Granger shared with us uh, last week, it looks like you know, at least on the click-through rates and conversions, um, the marketing objective of that pilot campaign seems to be met. Uh, is there a likelihood that Bosch or Granger would look at <clears throat> new campaigns with new uh, new partners, and if there are any restrictions uh, on that? So that's uh, Joshua's question. Um, <clears throat> the answer is yes. Um, of course, uh, we, we want to continue. I think as as you guys have probably seen, um, and some of you have already, I know, are on digital marketing careers, um, and some of you are learning for the first time, but so much of this is about 
um, being able to constantly optimize and constantly get better at campaigns, um, utilizing data, right? And 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 this is kind of the beauty of digital marketing in in, in its uh, in its most simplistic form is um, being able to understand that there's a lot of different levers you can change. Um, making sure that when you change something, you're understanding the impact of that change, trying to have a theory on why that created a change, and then being able to, in hope, in hopeful cases, find a successful element that you can continue to, to drive, uh, drive your market with. So in this case, um, the answer would be yes. Uh, we would look into additional campaigns. The question is, um, what do we want to change? What do we want to make better? Can we make it better? Um, and that's something that maybe Reshma can talk a little bit about as well from a high level. Um, without giving you guys too much insight into where we're going, um, but uh, but uh, she's she's working directly on that. So as Sony mentioned, I am working directly with Granger on um, on this basically, and what we've seen is um, I would say yes, uh, our expectations have been met, but in the sense of you know how to improve the campaign, we've looked at possibly using different sort of graphics to capture a larger category versus having, you know, one tool or one accessory that's highlighted in these campaigns. We've looked at, you know, possibly doing this with other partners, but the right partners, right? We wouldn't want to open it up to every one of our retail partners because we would want to make sure that our investment is is optimized, essentially. And um, so when it also comes to Granger, it's not just us kind of working on this. It's working with them to make sure that we're hitting the right audience, that we're marketing or retargeting, I would say, uh, the right categories when it comes to what Granger users are specifically looking at when it come, when they're looking at the different tools and accessory categories that we that we own. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, sonation, Reshma. Uh, Reshma, to add on, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I think we are, uh, you know, later in the uh, capstone, we, you know, we ask uh, the learners to come up with, uh, you know, content strategy as well with some mm -hmm. pointers on uh, what would their suggestions be on what things to highlight, uh, or what sort of brand attributes to highlight. Um, I'm not sure to what extent, you know, uh, we have asked them to look at giving some visuals as well, but I'm not sure where uh, you know that assignment will, or, you know that task. What kind of output that will give? But hopefully that will also give some uh, diverse perspectives. You know, from a global audience on uh, the kind of or the message in the campaign that might help uh, create more conversions. So we look forward to that uh, output yeah. from the students as well. Um, so let's move on to uh, you know a couple of questions from uh, Nina. Uh, both are focusing on, um, you know, the Bosch and Gr Granger relationship. So first one uh, talks about <clears throat> do prices on power tools uh, differ based on the outlet um, that you have? So um, and if yeah. not, uh, sorry, you you see the question? Uh, yep, sorry, I can see it. Yep. Yeah. So um, we we don't have a uh, pricing is a, is a very complicated topic, so I'm going to try to simplify it to the to the point of this question. Um, we well, we don't we don't actively try to have a single partner have a better price position, and what I mean partner is a retail partner. So um, we don't we don't actively try to have one partner have a better pricing position than any other partner. Um, we think that it creates in in um, a, a very negative kind of approach of the marketplace. It also creates a level of competition that we're not trying to be a, a necessary part of. What we do do, and we do this uh, kind of retail partner um, agnostic, are promotions. So for example, for a certain time period, we may offer $10 off a certain product. And we allow all of our partners um, to have access to these promotions, um, specifically to help drive sales up from the user side. Um, but we don't say, Granger, here is a um, specific price for you, for your users, especially with the level of transparency that online brings. Um, also, there's antitrust issues with that. So we, we actively stay away from um, pricing at a retail partner. We uh, give them a price, and we offer them a, a book of promotions as well. 
Um, and maybe to your second question, I can read it out loud here. It says, uh, I noticed that not all power tools available on Bosch website can be purchased through Granger. Why is that something you'll be looking to in the future? A wider product line should increase the traffic to those loyal to the Bosch brand. So great question. Um, and, and, and really this is uh, what we call really an assortment question. Um, Granger, um, and though they can maybe speak to it next time uh, they're, they're on, but Granger obviously has to support uh, thousands of different vendors, um, not only from a website perspective in terms of listing them, but from a fulfillment standpoint um, and uh, an overall management standpoint. Therefore, um, Granger has to have a managed assortment, right? So they have to really think about their users and what their users need and supply products um, accordingly. From our side, we want to make sure that Granger is stocking those products that we think are very relevant to their user base because they may not have the time and energy and effort to look at every single product we have and say, yes, that's relevant, yet no, it's not. So there's quite a bit of process to this um, that happens all the time, which, for example, if we launch a new product, we present it to Granger, we communicate its benefits, um, and Granger makes a decision whether or not they think it's, it's, it's right for their user base. And if it is, um, they they can list it um, on their site, and then bring it into their stores, um, and they can decide on what their uh, inventory and assortment strategy will look like. Uh, thank you for that, and I think we are done with all the questions uh, uh, for the Hangout. Any uh, closing thoughts uh, first, Kevin? Um, well, I, I think we're just all really excited to see what students are producing. I think that this has been, a, we knew, a very difficult challenge to put in front of them, but something that I think they'll learn a great deal from, and it's just, uh, it's exciting to see what, what they're coming up with. Great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kevin, for your willingness to, you know, uh, keep uh, addressing student questions. Uh, um, uh, Bosch, uh, sorry, uh, Sonesh and Reshma, uh, over to you. Um, I I think it's like I said in the first place on the first hangout. I think this is one of the the, the most interesting uh, courses that uh, I've ever seen. I I'm very envious of many of the students, um, and I know many of you reached out to me on LinkedIn. I think it, please continue to if you guys want to have a, um, a, a separate discussion on some of these topics. I'm more than happy to to engage. Um, but yeah, it is uh, something that Kevin said is really really true that we don't have a lot of information, not in some cases that we just can't share, but in other cases you have to make decisions without full, um, without a foot, full portfolio of data. And that is truly, truly, truly the real world. And uh, especially if you want to be fast and if you want to be oriented to the market, um, you have to be able to, to kind of take some pieces of data, formulate an opinion, um, and be able to execute on that. And I think this course is going to teach many of you um, the reality of, of what data may look like versus maybe a textbook. So um, thank you guys for, for having us on. Um, uh, Reshma, I know you were a student not far back in the MBA, so what are your uh, perspectives on this kind of an exercise and this kind of uh, involvement with you being on the industry side now? Um, but as Kevin and Sony mentioned, really day in and day out we have to make assumptions sometimes and we're not given all of the data that you know that we want and so this this type of class really does teach you to kind of formulate everything based on everything that you may have and make some assumptions and you know have to go to the market with that strategy that you're able to come up with and uh, Michelle as you mentioned I wasn't I was a student not too long ago I think I graduated May of 2013 and um, it's these types of classes and this type of coursework that really helps differentiate you from the rest of the world. And having U of I and this class under your belt will really help you when it comes to when it comes time to looking for uh, jobs. It's work like this that you're able to present and talk about and set yourself again set yourself apart from the rest of the students uh, that are out there maybe competing for the same jobs. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to be on the call um, you know there's some other questions that have popped up but I'll put them on the forum and uh, perhaps we can take them offline uh, so th uh, thank you again and uh, happy holidays to you know the panelists and <clears throat> to all the listeners who are uh, watching us live thank you <laughs>